Time to get ready for the playoffs. Good to be with Tony and Rodney and Mike. I am still Tony. I haven't left this spot. I've been in the basement now for nine days, so I'm a little stir crazy. <laughs> so really, I am so happy. You guys, I might keep you here for an hour. It's so nice to have people and see <laughs> see my guys and feel comfortable here. You don't pay that so. well, Mike. I do. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Way to help out a friend, you know? I'm in quarantine in the basement. That's what I get from Rodney, but we're, we're all hanging in and doing okay. Hey, uh, really excited for the four games. This is always, we say, the best weekend of the football season, right? So let's start with our game on Saturday night. It's Baltimore going up to Buffalo. A little bit of snow in the forecast. Uh, Rodney, I'll, I'll let you kick off the conversation here because Baltimore's defense stepped up in the second half against Tennessee. Now they're going to have to step up against a very different and very explosive offense in Buffalo. Yeah, and just got off the phone, phone with Kayla's Campbell, and he said, hey, I asked him about the snow and the potential of snow, and he said, look, we're not concerned about that. We're playing um, good physical football right now. They have a lot of respect for Josh Allen. And really, when you, when, what the, the majority of our conversation was about Josh Allen and trying to keep him in the pocket, not allowing him to escape. They have a lot of respect for Josh Allen. But the main thing he told me for the 10 or 15 minutes that I spent time with him is we have to make sure that we tackle Josh Allen. And to me, that's kind of been the interesting thing, looking at Baltimore and Buffalo, uh, because in Buffalo's game, Lamar Jackson had to step up as a passer uh, as mm -hmm. Tennessee was trying to take him away as a runner. And then in the Buffalo game, Josh Allen became a runner. They hadn't really used him a lot on design runs all year, but that became a big part of their offense. So it's th these two quarterbacks, uh, they're, they're definitely going to be the bell cows, and how are they going to lead their teams uh, on Saturday. And that's one thing that fascinates me about this because both defenses are used to seeing a quarterback who can move, so it's not some foreign thing to them that they're going to be rattled by. They know it from practice. They've studied it. They've seen it. And I think that makes them a little bit better equipped to deal with the other team's mobile quarterback. But, yeah, for Lamar Jackson, it's got to be more diversification of the offense like we saw on Sunday against the Titans with Marquise Brown involved like we've never seen him before. And I think that was a great, great uh, development for the Bills, and they're going to need more of that if they want to win. I'm going to watch really early in this game for even the pregame. If it is snowing a little bit and there is an inch or so of snow in the forecast, I want to see how Lamar Jackson runs confidently and moves around. Do you remember the Monday night game they played at Cleveland? He had a ton of problems with his shoes and everything else. We know his speed and his elusiveness is important. He doesn't practice in the snow. He's never played in the snow. I'll be really curious to see how that impacts him. And Rodney and Tony, I'd love for you guys to weigh in on this. You know, for Baltimore and Lamar, it was about getting the win. So there's not the conversation of he hasn't won a playoff game. And for Buffalo, it had been the 25 years since winning the division and all that stuff. Now that they both did something, does that make it easier or harder as they take the next step, that really tough step, and win in the divisional round? Tony, I'll let you go first. I, I think it makes it easier. You do get that monkey off your back, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. Now you're just worried about the other team and preparing for them. So I think we're going to see the best of, of both teams for sure. I, I look at Lamar, and I think if, if you haven't had – experience playing in the snow if you haven't been out there I think it causes a lot of players problems you you saw what happened um, to uh, what team was that that went into Green Bay it, it was Tennessee that, that went into the Green oh, yeah. Bay and they looked a total uh, they looked a total mess so I think Lamar is going to struggle right. and as much even if they have success running the football he still he still will be forced to make a few plays down the field where where he's got to open up that offense and and right now I'm just really concerned but when I look at Buffalo's defense and just watching that defense coach, and I don't know how much tape you watch, they're very vulnerable up the middle. If you run straight down their throat, you can gain big yards, and, and I think that's going to be the story of the game. Let me just say real quickly, too, the difference between Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson getting their first playoff wins, I feel like the Bills got grazed by the Colts, that, that the Colts outplayed them when you look at the numbers, and it was Josh Allen who stepped up and got it done, but it wasn't an easy win. We had seen the Bills dominant, 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 and then they got rattled by the seventh seed. The Ravens, on the other hand, they have been winning and winning and winning with their backs against the wall. They went into Tennessee and beat the Titans there. I think they come out of it with more of a lift than the Bills do. The Bills just have to feel like what happened, it all could have ended. I think they may have less confidence going into this game than they would have had, and the Ravens' confidence hey. is through the roof. 
Hey, Floria, I don't think the Bills are sitting back worried about they, – they understand that this is the playoffs, and whether you win by 20 or whether you win by three points, a win is a win. And now you go from the wild card game to the divisional game. I just think they're not focused on how badly, you know, or, or how impressive they looked against the Colts. It's about here and now. Both these teams are very confident. And we saw just from how Buffalo acts, whether they're in the end zone, they make a big play. They're having fun. They're encouraging one another. They're cheering one another on. So I, I don't think Buffalo has an issue with the way they won. I just, I just know that they're happy that they won. And I want to get Tony back to one point before we move on to the next game, and that's John Harbaugh. Tony, you have coached in the playoffs. You've gone on the road in the playoffs. Just how incredible the numbers have been for John Harbaugh on the road over these years winning playoff games. I don't think people realize how difficult it is. That's one of the, the toughest things in the world is to win road playoff games because you're playing against the higher seed and you're playing right. <laughs> against a team that is competent at home and, and plays well. So for John to take these teams on the road year after year after year and win games, it's just phenomenal. But I think it speaks to their mentality. And Rodney talked about it. This is a competent team. Buffalo is going to be confident. But I, I guarantee you, Baltimore is going to be confident as well. We can go on the road and win, and we don't care where it is. And it, so you, you know, Coach, is funny. Bend, talking, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mike. Yeah, finish up. Just talking to Kalis, that's exactly how his demeanor was. He's like, look, they have Stephon Diggs. They have Josh Allen. He is fantastic. He was very complimentary. But at the end of the day, they believe in themselves. They believe in that defense. Mm -hmm. Brandon Williams is back. Calais Campbell is back. They feel like, and you look at the cornerback situation. We talk about Indianapolis. You compare Indianapolis Colts cornerbacks to the Baltimore Ravens cornerbacks, and that's going to be a big story. But the Ravens plan, they're playing, like I said, they're playing with a lot of confidence. They're playing physical. And I don't think Buffalo, I think Buffalo is going to be a one-dimensional team. I don't think Buffalo can come out and run the ball against these guys. I just, I don't see that happening, Mike Florio. Mike, I'm going to give you the first swing at the next game at Cleveland and Kansas City in the early window on Sunday. And another quarterback from that draft class in Baker Mayfield, three from the same draft class that also had Sam Darnold and Josh Rosen will in the first round. Uh, Kansas City's been waiting on the sidelines for as thrilling and as awesome as the Cleveland story and start of the game was. You wake up to the reality that the best team in the AFC had their feet up last week. They've been resting and they're ready to go. I'm fascinated about this one. What are, you, what are your first thoughts on Browns at Chiefs? Well, I mean, I would love for it to be like the Patrick Mahomes Baker Mayfield game from 2016. Final score is 66 59. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's going to be <laughs> that, right. though. That's right. But, but, and, and, and look, what, what the Browns need to do. And we talked last week about what the Colts need to do against the Bills. you got to limit the possessions of a great offense. There's a clear talent gap between the Chiefs and the Browns. So, and the Browns have the running game. And they need to convince Baker Mayfield, you can't be gunslinger with Patrick Mahomes. You have to be game manager in this one. And we've got to keep Patrick Mahomes on the sideline. We've got to grind it out. We've got to shorten the game. We've got to limit their number of possessions. That's the only way to keep them under 30 points, is to limit the number of times that the Chiefs are on the field and try to use that offense to just slowly churn, get a field goal when you can, get a touchdown when you can, and hope that you can find a way to outscore the Chiefs. That, to me, is the only way the Browns can pull it off, and even then, it's an uphill climb. Coach? Well, I would uh, tend to disagree with Mr. Florio a little bit. Patrick Mahomes and the Good. Chiefs have lost one game in a year and a half, and they lost that game when the other team scored 40 points. So if I'm Cleveland, that's what I'm thinking about going in there. Hey, my defense, hopefully we can get it done. Hopefully we can make some plays like we did against Pittsburgh. But you know what? We're going to need points. And so Chubb, Kareem Hunt, my running backs, they've, they've got to run the ball. They've got to be explosive. I'm going to have to hit some passes, and we're going to have to score touchdowns. We're probably going to have to win this game 35-31, and offense is, is going to have to do it. If this were a legal proceeding, I would be asking the court reporter to mark the spot in the record where the Hall of Fame defensive coach advocates a shootout. <laughs> I have changed. So, um, forget defense hey, now. You can't win the defense in the playoffs. Florio, that's the only way you're going to have a chance because you, these guys are rested the last two weeks. You're not going to stop them from scoring. Patrick Mahomes has been sitting on that couch. He can't wait to get back on that football field. And I agree with Coach wholeheartedly. Baker Mayfield, and yes, you can run the ball and try to milk the clock, but at the end of the day, you got to score touchdowns and you got to score a bunch of them if you want to compete against those guys.
So noted, Counselor. Uh, Rodney, I just want to come back to you <laughs> on one part of this deal here. What Cleveland did last week, uh, you know, you were in the locker rooms. You know what it's like when players band together and get something special from afar, just watching that. You could feel adrenaline within you, if you weren't a Steelers fan, for what Cleveland accomplished. As a player watching that, you were there. What, what did Cleveland accomplish in your eyes by doing that against all odds on Sunday night in Pittsburgh? Well, first of all, I mean, if I were if I were a guy in um, Pittsburgh, I would have just pulled Juju Smith-Schuster to the side and said, like, what are you doing? What an idiotic statement. Yeah. You know, it was just such a disrespectful and an unnecessary comment. This is an 11-5 team. They deserve to be in the playoffs and have their opportunity. And when you watch them on tape, this is a good football team. So it was just, you know, it's just one of those things where you just, you, you feel like, you know, Juju and the Pittsburgh Steelers really took the Cleveland Browns for granted. And Cleveland, they accomplished a whole lot, not having your coach, not having your start in secondary. And just the way those guys banded together, they became a team. That's what they accomplished. Yeah, I know winning the wild card game is a significant thing for them, but just co coming together more and being that team that they can trust one another in those tight situations. The, the guy named comment that Baker Mayfield made after the game to Michelle Tafoya, that, that just like defined what that game was all about. And they get a bunch of the players back off the COVID list and they get Kevin Stefanski back. And uh, Mike, as Rodney kind of pointed me in that direction a few weeks ago, kind of a coach of the year type season. Go ahead, Rods. Yeah. I, I was wondering, like, why do you, why, do a coach? Florio, you weren't there. They, I think they picked Pittsburgh to win, and I think Rodney Harrison was the only one that picked the Cleveland Browns against all odds to step up despite everybody, despite um, the head coach Whoa. being in the basement, Whoa. against a Hall yeah, of Fame yeah, future right. coach. Wow. Mm -hmm. Say what you want, Mike. Good. That was the biggest I, win I, of I the have, year. I have to pat well, myself well. on the back. Wait, ahead, but, but yeah. America also picked Cleveland, which sure, means Rodney exactly. no longer hates America. <laughs> That's true. And, and what, I like the, what I like the most about that comment right there is the old school guy you trust just stopped the entire proceeding to say, look at me, and point to the name on the back of his jersey. So that's good. That's really good. You see, 2021 is different. Hey, um, Mike, coach is, taught me well. Yeah. <laughs> Stop that. So, Rodney, I, I'm going to say this in all honesty. Rodney, you, you opened my eyes to a possibility that I think is going to become the reality. I was thinking for sure one way with my vote for Coach of the Year, and you brought up Kevin Stefanski. We were talking about this after week 16, before week 17, and I think with the way things went in Miami and the way things finished in Cleveland, a lot of folks did change their vote. Mike, we're at the coaching season now. There are seven openings as we go through this, whatever process uh, as you watch this. Uh, you brought up a great point that I'd love for you to point out to everybody and bring up with Coach Dungy here. Well, I, you know, and this is something that Co D Coach Dungy raised, and I think it makes a ton of sense. We, we have we have cookie cutter molds for who who coaches are going to be, who are going to be successful. And Coach, you mentioned John Harbaugh earlier. I mean, this wasn't a traditional hire, and it just seems like so many of these owners continue to demand something that is traditional instead of thinking creatively and maybe getting a guy that's going to be their coach for 10, 15, 20 years. No, I've, I've talked to a couple of general managers. I've talked to a couple of owners over this process and everybody who, where can I get the sizzle? How can I get my fan base excited? I've got to get the hottest offensive coordinator. I've got to get the hottest defensive coordinator in, in the playoffs. And it, it, it really, when you look at who has been effective and who's done the job, it's those people that can lead men who can change mm. cultures. And I remember talking to Ozzie Newsom and he said, you know what? John Harbaugh was just what I was looking for. I was looking for a, a leader. And yes, he was only the special teams coach, but I didn't care about that. Well, Ozzie knows, Newsom knows football. And that to me is, is the big thing. And, and we've got to get away from that. Kevin Stefanski didn't come in and fix Baker Mayfield. Kevin Stefanski changed the whole culture in Cleveland. He went from hey, we've got the number one draft choice quarterback to, you know what, we're going to keep track of how many times on offense we knock defenders down. And we're going to mm -hmm. be physical. And we're going to be a team. And we aren't going to care if we don't have our head coach and we don't have our best offensive lineman and we don't have our secondary. We're the Cleveland Browns. We're a team. That kind of mentality, that's what you've got to get across. That's what coaches do. And that can come from anywhere. 
uh, that doesn't have to be the offensive coordinator who, who calls all these plays. That's what I think we've got to get owners to understand. Yeah, Mike, and I, I, Coach, absolutely right. And when you look at Kevin Stefanski, he's not, with his personality and his demeanor, he's not that coach that's going to walk in and throw chairs or anything like that. When he's doing his interviews, he's nice and calm. He has a r real calm, calming demeanor, just like you. It's in, and the thing that I like about him, he holds everyone um, accountable, but he also he respects the guys in that locker room. And when a coach respects you and you feel like, you know, you have the attention of the coach and the coach is open open-minded the players will communicate with the coach and the coach respect the players the players respect the coach and he's taken away all those negative distractions you don't hear those comments you don't hear Baker Mayfield saying something crazy or anything like that these guys are hundred percent focused and the reason why they were so successful is because of the foundation that Kevin Stefanski laid that's why he was able to sit in the basement and they're able to run the ball and do some of the things some of the basic things that they do it's because of the coach he is hands down the coach of the year he has been absolutely fantastic go ahead Mike Florio I know you well, yeah, let me, to say well, I, I wanted to chime in on on this notion of the, the coaching hiring process because you know, it yeah. comes up from time to time that, that guys don't don't interview well. And whether it was Bruce Arians, who's kind of gruff and says what he wants, and Mike Zimmer, who's very in your face and tells it like it is, and it took them years to find a head coaching job. And now you got Eric Bieniemy. Like, why can't he get serious consideration? And I wish that these owners would realize you're not hiring someone to sit and talk in a boardroom for an hour and a half. You're hiring someone to lead a locker room full of football players, and you need to watch how they interact with their players. Watch Eric Bieniemy on the sidelines of a game. You can see that he connects with his players listen to what Patrick Mahomes says about Eric Bieniemy. you can hear it in his voice that he believes in Eric Bieniemy. so this whole interview process to me I think all too often the owners lose sight of the fact that what the guy says and what he does when he's in a suit and tie and he's uncomfortable and it's an hour and a half of talking and it's not what he does for a living and and it just astounds me that the model continues down that path when it's obvious that that has nothing to do with what a guy's gonna do when he's a coach Mike, Mike, I would I was say an we, assistant. Go ahead, Tony. Go I was Tony. an assistant coach for 15 years, and I heard that over and over. I didn't interview well. And to me, that just means the owner didn't like me. That, and that's okay. You didn't like my mm -hmm. style, but don't say I didn't interview well because that had nothing to do with it. You didn't like the way I am, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Eric Bieniemy not interviewing well or a certain coach not interviewing well, uh, that, that, that's just a, a fallacy. I would say this as we pivot to the NFC and you look at the higher in Green Bay and Matt LaFleur who's been 13 and 3 these two years and Sean McVay who's had success. I think some of the really good hires happen with the ownership and team presidents who are around their locker room who get a feel for a guy who would be a good leader of men. Those who are in business, it doesn't mean that they can't hire good coaches, but they're used to dealing with the CEO, the corporate part of it. You get the guys who get a sense of the room, and somebody, I've seen this trait in this coach in our, our group. His players play really well for him. Those may be the guys who have a good sense. You think of Steve Bishotti like that with the hire of Harbs and relying on Ozzie Newsom, like you said, Tony. Rely on the football guys because they got a sense. They've been there. They've been led by bad coaches. They've been led by good coaches. Let me spin to the Rams in Green Bay and, and this playoff game of here's uh, Sean McVay who got to the Super Bowl with a terrific offense, and now they're riding the number one defense, and they're going to have their hands full with a great matchup with the number one offense in Aaron Rodgers. Rodney, as we uh, lay out the Rams against the Packers, what are your first thoughts? My first thoughts are, you know, I don't know if Aaron Donald is 100% healthy, but they're going to definitely need him. But even if they don't have him at 100%, I think they're still going to be okay. They're not going to be as good as they would be, obviously, with Aaron Donald at 100% because other guys on the Rams have stepped up and played well on that defensive front. Leonard, um, Floyd, he's been great. The secondary is playing extremely well. So if I'm the Rams, I feel pretty confident from a defensive standpoint coming in there. I think their biggest challenge will be A.J. Dillon, Aaron Jones in the passing game. I think Green Bay, he's fresh, he's healthy. He's been off the last couple weeks. I think they're going to give him more opportunities as a you know running back lined up as a wide receiver. And um, I'm looking really looking forward to just seeing Aaron Rodgers. And if they can protect Rodgers, it could get ugly. 
Well, everybody's going to say the Rams have no chance. Warm weather team going into Lambeau Field and going without your quarterback or Jared Goff being injured, but they have the right formula. Rodney talked about it. Those pass rushers, they've got a secondary that can cover. They can play defense. And then on the other side of the ball, even if Jared Goff can't go, they can run the football, which has been the Achilles heel of, of Green Bay. So I think it's a neat matchup. It depends on two things to me. Aaron Donald's health, that's critical. He's got to be himself. And then number two, they've got to be able to deal with the elements. They've got to go in there mentally and say, you know what, it is going to be cold, but we can go do this. No Rip snow, by the sleeves. way. Mid-20s mid yeah. and cloudy, by the way, so not terrible. Go ahead, Mike. Rip off the sleeves, Bud Grant style, no coats on the sideline. That's the way to do it, <laughs> the way the Minnesota teams used to. But I got, I got two things on this. One, if they put Jalen Ramsey on Devontae Adams and say, you take yeah, care of him, nice. will Aaron Rodgers still mm -hmm. see a window and still throw it in there? Because, you know, with Aaron Rodgers' accuracy, you could still find a crease where you could get the ball in if Ramsey otherwise has him covered. And secondly, Aaron Jones, contract year. 24 teams home watching this game. This is his chance to get paid by somebody, and the Packers need that running game to, to kind of open up the passing game because other than Devontae Adams, who do they have? So I, I, those are the two key players for me. Yeah, that's what I'm going to watch. Will they match up? Will that be an island and a fun one to watch where you visit a few times and then it becomes Robert Tunyon, MVS, Marquez Valdez, Scantling, uh, maybe both backs at the same time with one split out like Rodney was talking about. Fascinating choices for Green Bay on offense if you think Ramsey and Adams are going to go over here and have a terrific battle that we could sell on pay-per-view. One more, guys. Tampa Bay, New Orleans. Uh, Tony, d did you say enough nice things about the Buccaneers when you got home? Was everybody happy that you, uh, you gave them all the plaudits and credits for the win in Washington? No, they weren't happy with me. I tried to talk about how well they played, what a great game plan Todd yes. Bowles had, how good Tom right, Brady was. But they said all I talked about was Taylor Heineke, and, and I did. He was fantastic. <laughs> but uh, I think the quarterback that the Bucks are going to play this week is going to be a little bit better than Taylor Heineke. So we'll see. It should be a great matchup with Drew Brees and Tom Brady. Yeah, and to me, I, I look at Antonio Brown, man. He's just been so impressive. He's been their best wide receiver the last month of the season. They're getting him involved, moving him around, giving him different opportunities. I look for him to continue his fascinating play. And, um, you know, Tom Brady just seems very comfortable with him right now. Well, and think about the last two Saints games. Week one, right out of the gates. What was the comment earlier this week? Tom Brady didn't even know where to sit when he, when he right. uh, showed up on the sidelines for the first game. Week nine, they got blown out. It, it went sideways early, and that was that. This is a full year now of Tom Brady, 17 games of Tom Brady playing with the Buccaneers. He knows that offense so much better. They know him so much better. It's a far different team than it was, and I think psychologically the fact that the Saints won the first two games gives the Buccaneers a powerful edge in this one. Also, three straight years now, the Saints have had their hearts ripped out and shown to them in the playoffs at some point. And Correct. how can you not Correct. feel like that's coming? If you're a Saints player, Devin White, know Mike, Devin White, he's back. His return uh, inside linebacker who's in a, a second team all pro to have him back there with Levante David will certainly give him a chance to run around and deal with Kamara and all that other stuff. It's going to be a great weekend. <laughs> we'll see you all Saturday night as we get you ready for the Bills and the Ravens in our NBC game. Enjoy this uh, best weekend of the year, divisional playoffs, and we will see you over the weekend. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.